All right, we're being recorded. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start now because I know we have a few minutes here. I know, first of all, Renee, thank you for having me. Um, and I've been told and been reading here that you guys have had an awesome conference this week. So hopefully all of you um, got this information in here and sinking it in in your, in your future endeavors here. So um, good luck to you with that. And I know there are current teachers. I know there are future teachers in here um, and other guests. Thank you for joining this session. Um, I will try my best to somehow, some way, do a two-week two lecture into a one-hour session here about special ed. Um, this is a resource-driven uh, course that I teach at Pierce College. Um, so I'm going to try to be informative and answer all your questions today. Um, a quick background. Uh, my name is Cal Enriquez. Um, I will explain about this system in a little bit here. I used to work for the regional center system, both Westside and North LA Regional Center. My heart and passion is birth to age three. I work in Early Start. I was the director of Early Start recently at North LA Regional Center. Um, so I have 24, 25 years experience there working with children with disabilities, especially birth to three. I currently now work for um, accredited home care. I'm the manager for respite and caregiving services for regional center consumers, which again, we'll go over the regional center in a little bit here. Um, Currently, this is my 20th year anniversary, everyone. I'm an adjunct child development adjunct professor at Pierce College, and this is my 20th year anniversary. And um, for the last 20 years, obviously, times have changed, things have changed, and classrooms now to this point, virtual and all this stuff. So I've seen it all in the last 20 years. So um, I really felt old the other semester, this past semester, when one of the students told me that their mother took my class. I hate you. I dropped her. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to talk about special ed and the federal mandates and all that stuff. So um, again, I'll be glad to share this PowerPoint with you guys. I know Renee will be doing that. So um, this is in important information for you guys to know, because as you move forward, becoming teachers, you guys need to know the, um, the bylaws and the process of the special ed laws and the IEP process. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. I'm going to come back to you for any questions. I'm going to try to go every three minutes, come back to you for questions, okay? Because I know when I share my screen, I won't be able to um, see all of you, okay? Wow, we got 50 people in this room. It's like paparazzi. Thank you. My God, I feel popular. Um, here we go. All right. The first thing we're going to talk about is the laws, okay? Um, you guys need to know this. Some of you already know this. So I understand it, but I'm going to re re uh, re uh, go through this. Okay. So Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Everyone, this is the federal mandate. This is the federal law that encompasses special education for all children uh, from birth to age three or birth to age 22. Okay. Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So if you had a midterm with me, you're gonna pretty much have to define what IDEA stands for, but no midterms, I promise. Um, so this is the federal law that ensures and mandates services to all children who qualify for special education. So some of you have heard the terminology of the IEP and so forth. Um, this is the law that instates that uh, particular process called the IEP, okay? IDEA is broken down to two sections, okay? Um, one is called IDEA Part C, all right? So broken down to two sections here. IDEA Part C is special ed, but in the federal terms, they call it early intervention, okay? Birth to age three, okay? In California, the program that houses early intervention and early start, maybe some of you might wanna go into early start uh, and profession and so forth. The regional centers of California, which I'm gonna talk about in about 20 minutes or so, houses the early start program in California. Every other state has its own state program, but every state in the U.S. has early intervention, okay? I'll talk about that more thoroughly later, okay? Idea part B, which is I think most of you are going to school age, right? Elementary school years and high school. Idea part B is when you hear the terminology called the IEP process. Idea part B describes and defines the mandate of special education services from children age three to age 22 Regardless of what state in the United States, school districts are responsible to carry out IDEA Part B, okay? So hence, that defines the IEP process, which we're going to go over, I promise, okay? Uh, today, for early intervention, we have 400,000 400, eligible infants and toddlers and families in, that we serve 
um, in, in actually, this is California. So we serve 400,000 eligible infants here in toddlers, idea part C. Those are, and those numbers are growing, trust me, okay? Especially with the growth of autism, okay? And, and currently for uh, school district folks, we serve 6.5 million children in use who receive special ed services and related services to meet their individual needs um, in special education. So 6.5 million growing. Um, I know some of the questions about boys versus girls. I can tell you this, um, most of the children in special ed, pretty much like a 65%, 35% split are boys, okay? That's something for you guys to read more articles on and so forth. So I'm just sharing that with you, okay? Before I go on to the next PowerPoint, I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna ask any of you have any questions, you can just shout it out or I'm trying to read the chat if any of you have questions, but does any of you have questions about the federal mandates? We're good? We're good. What is the uh, yes. man uh, federal man mandate? Federal mandate, Sinead, you're going to look back in it because I know people are coming in. It's Individuals okay. with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, Part B and C. You'll get that PowerPoint. Uh, that's the federal mandate uh, throughout the our U.S., the country of U.S., implementing the special ed programming in, in, in the U.S. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Sorry. Um, hold on here. All right. Uh, I'll talk about early start first. All right, for all of you, um, maybe personal or professional level, if you work with children from birth to three, or if you know someone from birth to three, personal level, this will be a great resource for you. This is something you guys should know because I know you guys are gonna be focused on school age or working in elementary school years, but I need to share this with you because special ed actually starts at birth. So some of you, you're gonna work in early start or some of you may work with children under three on a personal, maybe in a preschool setting, maybe you may look at or observe children who are exhibiting delays or some form of concerns with their overall development. Well, this is a great resource for you, okay? So right now I'm gonna talk about Early Start. Um, again, Early Start is under IDEA, it's a federal program, okay? Every state carries this program and we all carry it the same way because it's a federal mandate. So what is Early Start? For North LA, I'm not going to show this slide, but to make a point of this, for North LA Regional Center, I'm not going to show that slide because it's a little bit too thin. We already went over this. The California CESA, um, their early start program that's run by the state of California, just to let you know, DDS is our state department, Department of Developmental Services. They're the ones that make sure that California is running the early start program and following the federal mandates, okay, of early start, okay? Um, 1993, just to let you guys know, Early Start became an official program throughout the whole entire state, uh, the United States. It became its own department. Instead of mixing it in with special ed in elementary school years, Early Start became its own uh, department or its own idea part C. So in 1993, pretty much Early Start became official. Okay. Now, this is what I want you guys to, of all the slides I'm going to show you, this is huge here. Okay because Early Start has a different eligibility criteria versus school district, okay? So for a child birth to three, remember, Early Start is a benefit. It's a beneficial services for these children because it early starts their growth and development as they go through uh, the school age years, maybe receiving special ed services. So Early Start, you have three categories, okay? Three categories that will make a child eligible for Early Start. Once they're eligible, they can receive early start services. We'll go over that in a little bit here, what kind of services we provide them, okay? But these are the three categories, pretty much in order of the number of referrals that receive. If a child, birth to three, is exhibiting a 33% delay or a third delay in any of these five domains, they will qualify for early start. So I'm gonna use an example of, because my math skills are off here. So I'm gonna use an example of a 24 month old, okay? A 24 month old comes in, we do an assessment, all right? We have to do a full assessment if the child is exhibiting a third delay. So 24 divided by three, which is a third, is eight. 24 minus eight is 16 months. So if a child is performing a 16th month level or below in any of these five domains, they qualify for early start, 
okay? So if you guys know someone on a personal level or professional level, and you're seeing some children under age three exhibiting some delays, you will call their normal their, their local regional center to initiate an early start referral. Okay, and we'll go over that in a little bit here about the referral process. Another category is called high risk factors. These are conditions, okay, that may lead, like a medical condition that may lead to someone having a permanent developmental disability. Okay, so a high risk factor, for example, if a child is born premature, under 32 weeks gestation, under 1500 grams, that is a child that's going to qualify for early start automatically. We have a lot of children who are medically dependent on ventilators and have medical issues. Um, we have a lot of children in DCFS, the foster uh, home placement uh, program. We have a lot of children prenatally drug exposed. Those are high risk factors, okay? So those children with those high risk factors are also a qualifier for early start program, okay? And established risk here in California, um, we develop a category. So basically, I'm going to go over that in a little bit here. But established risk means that a child under that is birth to three, okay, that means they're going to be permanent regional center clients for the rest of their lives. And established risk basically means they have a permanent developmental disability under these four categories. Autism, intellectual disability, which is mental retardation. We can start diagnosing MR or intellectual disability at age three. Autism, we can diagnose very young now, 18 months, 14 months now. And then the other two categories is epilepsy, seizures, and cerebral palsy. So again, those are established risks. Um, we'll go over the regional center system in a little bit here, but I know I'm going a little bit too fast, but if you can remember this PowerPoint, if you work with children and you're feeling that one of these kiddos are in these categories, then it's time for you to call the parents, give that resource, for them to call the regional center in California to start that early start referral, okay? Because it's to make you guys make more sense out of this, look at this as a special education program. We just call it early start, okay? I'm going to stop the slide. I'm going to have any questions. Any questions? Oh, man, there's a lot of people in this room. I have a question. Okay, hold on. Nancy, go first. Um, for... These services, the regional, is that available for every parent? Yes. So in the state Regardless of California. Of income or? Yes. Or like, um, okay, thank you. Income has no factor. So families, you know, socioeconomic status has no factor in this. Everyone has availability for this service, everyone in California. And is it like um, local to your, to where yeah. you live? Or yeah, Nancy, I'm going to talk about the regional center. We have 21 regional centers in California. I'm going to talk about the regional centers next. Okay, 21 regional centers are assigned to a catchment or geographic area of California. So depending where you live, I will give you that information, that particular regional center who you call to initiate that intake. And it's so, um, even if, let's say, there, you think that the 33% it might be like 30 or 25. Is it still okay to get assessed at a regional center? Like um, recommend to get assessed at a regional center? Nancy, here's my thing to all of you, Nancy. So if you work with a child or have a child on a personal or know a child on a personal level, if you feel there are delays, period, right? You're not gonna know, unless you're really into this field, you're not gonna know exactly what, how much percentage or how delayed they are. So, but if you have a sense of a child being delayed to all of you in this room, refer the family to the regional center because they're going to get a free assessment okay these Thank assessments you. are free and these services are free so make the referral let the family make that choice to make that referral right it's parent choice it's voluntary but once they make that call the regional centers and the early start program are going to do an assessment for that child and let them determine if they qualify how much they're delayed okay now if they don't fit into the category they just won't qualify for early start Nancy, did I answer your question? Yes, that makes sense. Uh, even more so. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else before I move on? There are May I have a question? Yes, Carolina. So, so my son was enrolled in a um, uh, regional center. So uh, last year, uh, because of the pandemic and all this, I didn't get the appointment with, with the person that go and check uh, like every year. Um, 
Go. how he's doing all uh, this. Sure. So can I go back? Um, Carolina, Carolina yes. I'm going to give you my email and I want you to email me because I don't want to talk about cases during this conference. Okay, perfect. I'll, Thank e you. I'll give you my email in the chat room. Don't worry. Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to go kind of, where's early start? Here? All right. So real quick, um, you're going to get these PowerPoints. I know the school district, you guys call it IEPs. For early start, it's called individualized family service plans. Okay. The key, the key word to this is the F word. It's family. There's a big difference between an IFSP and an IEP. In the IFSP and early start, the, the difference is that the family's involved. The emotions are there. We help the parents adjust to their child's disability. The hardest, the stressor for families, okay? Remember, early start goes to age three, third birthday. After third birthday, guess where they go? They go to the school district. This is why I need to explain to you the early start process because when you guys get children at age three, four, and five, most likely they receive services from early start, okay? So this is why I have to explain the process. To make a long story short, our plan in early starts called individualized family service plan, emphasize the word F word family. That's the focus point of this whole process with early start because parents have to participate in all the services the child's receiving, okay? And just to make a long story shorter, all of the services in early start are done in the child's natural environments, okay? Family's home, neighborhood park, gyms in the mall, wherever. These are natural environments. This is not in a classroom setting, okay? This is why families have a hard time transitioning to the school district because once involved in the school district, it becomes a classroom setting. You see the difference? So that's one of the main differences between early start and then school district special ed, okay? I'm gonna move forward, I'm gonna go a little fast. IFSPs, I know IEP is reviewed annually or if needed sooner. IFSP is reviewed every six months, just to let you know. And again, like the IEPs, we have outcomes and goals and so forth. But for uh, federal mandates for early start, we have to at least call the family every six months with their IFSP team just to review progress. Okay. If you guys want a job in the regional centers, uh, maybe some of you, I know most of you guys are future teachers in here, but maybe some of you might become a uh, interested working in the regional center. Um, I used to supervise them. So they're called service coordinators. They're actually like social workers, but service coordinators are the, the titles that are given to them that work at the regional center. It's exactly what it's called, service coordinators. Your job is to coordinate the resources and services for your children and families in your caseload, okay? To make it a long story short, so some of you have child development majors, education majors. If you guys wanna veer into the social work part of uh, education, regional centers always are hiring and this is a good experience for you guys. Um, so you guys know the case management and the social work side of things, okay? I'm gonna come back to you, hold on. Again, I already explained this to you, um, although you're gonna get this PowerPoint, parents and families have a major role in early start. They're the ones to have to get the recommendations by the therapist, and when the therapist goes home, they have to become the therapist and work the services with their child during the week, okay? So parent participation is huge. Natural environments, again, we talked about this. Early start, all the services are provided by in their natural environment, and this is a federal mandate. However, I can admit to this, there are some therapists, you know, for whatever reason, can go to the home and so forth. We get that. We do have clinics or offices in the community that early start children can go to the clinic and get therapy as well for whatever services they may need. Yeah, we'll get a slap on the wrist by the state, but I'd rather have the child get services than wait for someone to come to their home. Because sometimes, depending on the uh, service deliveries and so forth, we like to get the services started in a hurry and early start so we can get things going. Okay? So, yeah, I may have given you the natural environment speech here, but just to let you know, we do have clinics and businesses in the community that provides the services that are non-natural environment. Okay? The IFSP team, just go over real quick. It could be consist of your service coordinators, possible child development specialists. Listen, there's another job opportunity. If you want to work with children from birth to three as quote unquote teachers, we call them child development specialists. So if you want to go veer into the birth to three field, 
they're called child development specialists. And from there, you would work with many of your children in your case, so you go to their home and you are the teacher working with that child overall developmentally. So that's kind of a cool job too. And these are some of the professionals that may be part of the IFSP team, or these are some of the professions in the field of special ed that you might be interested in going into as well, okay? Just wanna give you that opportunity, okay? Every child is different, so every child has a different IFSP team, okay? Um, real quick, the providers have to give us reports every six months, give them recommendations throughout the week. We have a medical team. Every regional center has a medical unit, so their job is to get current medical records every year for that particular client just to make sure that we're following medical guidelines with their medical team as well. So every uh, child in the Early Start program in their IFSP team, they're pediatricians on the team, okay? We include them. We give them a copy of the IFSP so they know what's going on with their patient, okay? And real quick, the transition process. So this is called the transition. So when a child is two and a half years old in Early Start, receiving early start services, we start to prepare the transition. So at two and a half or older, whenever they get into our system, we start, it's called transition because we're helping them transition to idea part B. We have to prepare them when they turn three, the school districts start services at age three. So we begin the transition process at two and a half and older. Hopefully the IEP is held by then if it's a nice smooth transition, if you will, smooth transition, if it's a smooth transition by age three, our children in early start have had their IEP and hence when their child turns three, they'll receive their IEP services with the school district. In a perfect world, that's what the transition process is. Yeah, there are hiccups and delays, but we're not gonna go into that. But a transition process simply means that um, for early start, it transitions in them to the preschool part of the IEP process through the school district. There are a lot of transitions in schools, right? So early start to um, preschool, preschool to school age, school age to middle school, middle school to high school, and then high school to college or vocational skills, right? Those are transition steps. So this is the early start transition to the school district, okay? Before a child turns three, blah, blah, we won't get into that. These are the resources that you guys will grab here um, in the PowerPoint, and I'll be glad to send you some too. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I know I went a little fast, but I wanted to make sure that I answer all your questions before I go on to the next slide. Questions on early start? Uh, for the, hi. Hi, uh, for the, Yeah, for the early start, if a child is 2.11 months, 2 right. years and 11 months. That's right. But the parent just finally say, oh, I want to do a referral. So is it okay that I suggest the parent to wait until the child turns three to do a referral? Okay, so this is my suggestion. So if a child's 211, because okay, I'm gonna give you timelines here, okay? So um, I forgot, Eileen, you asked a question, right? So Eileen, so when a family calls the uh, Regional Center for Early Start Services, we have a 45 day process to determine eligibility. That's our federal mandate, 45 day process, okay? So. Obviously, if a child's 211, 210, we're not going to quite make the 45-day process. However, however, okay, even though the child's referred to us at 211, we will help them transition to the school district. Okay? The only thing I mean, I cannot promise you, if that 211, depending where they're at at 2 years 11, you know, I don't know if we're enough time to give them early start services. So we're going to have to do a quick transition to the school district. Okay? And... Um, for, school, for, for timelines, early start is a 45 day timeline. For the school district, so if you have a child over three, we'll go over that in a little bit here, it's a 60 day timeline, okay? That's the federal mandate, okay? We'll go over that in a little bit. Eileen, did I answer your question? So well, that means? Eileen, unmute. So that means it's good for the children to wait until three to do the process because the 45 day, they can't meet it. Well, it's a good idea to get it. Well, this is what I tell, Eileen, this is what I tell families. You, you may as well get the evaluation from early start because it's free because then the parents will kind of know, right? Um, if they're gonna qualify, if what the delays are. But also, um, Eileen, I'm gonna talk about the regional center next because then they may qualify for the regional center because depending on the concerns, we're gonna talk about the regional center now in about two seconds here. Maybe 
if they're concerns like autistic features, seizures, epilepsy, it's a good idea to make that referral to the regional center at least simultaneously with the school district. I see. Yeah. Okay. I think it's an Thank overall, you. it's an overwhelming process. Trust me. I, I can't do this in an hour. Believe me, I will email you my email address so we can talk further. Okay. Thank you so much. Anyone else before I go into the regional center side of things? No one has questions? Man, you're like my students. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip over to the regional center side. Okay, actually, hold on. Yeah, let's talk about the regional. Either way, we're good. Uh, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna skip around. We're gonna talk about the, um, the IEP process, okay? Um, because it, it kind of piggybacks to the early start part of it. All right. So this is the IEP. Some of you, most of you have heard of the IEP process. It's Individualized Education Program or Plan. This is the plan that is given to all children who qualify and are eligible for special ed students. Okay. Before I move to this presentation, I just want to let you guys know, teachers, future teachers and current teachers, you guys are vital in this process. Okay. Because if you do have a student in your classroom that are you may be struggling in your classroom or it may have some needs, you know, learning disability or some form of a concern you may think the student may have, you are the one that must initiate the IEP referral in a classroom setting. This is why teachers, you're important for this. So if you notice a child is struggling or a pupil is struggling in your classroom, you are the ones that must recognize this, right? And initiate the IEP process with your administrator, your vice principal, your principal in your school. That's where it starts, all right? This is why special ed is huge because as teachers, whether or not you teach in special ed or regular ed, you must identify children who potentially have delays or have issues in a classroom setting. That's your job, okay? So this is why this lecture or this presentation is huge for you, okay? So this is an IEP. I'm gonna go over it real quick. So every child who gets special ed services qualified gets an IEP plan. We just went over the regional center early start plan. It's called IFSP. But for education, for IEPs, the one thing about IEPs, not to knock school districts or the federal plan, it's just the family is not involved in these plans. It's more educational related in the classroom. Okay? So that's a big difference. That's why early start families have a hard time transitioning to the IEP plan. Okay? Because they miss that family component. They miss their therapist going to the homes. All right? For parents, we have to help as regional center staff, right? We have to help the family transition to the IEP process and hopefully make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Okay. I'm not going to go over all the overall IEP stuff, but basically it's an overall strategy designed to deliver special ed services for children aged three to 22. Yes, special ed services ages, uh, ends at age 22. Okay. Some may graduate at age 18 for the California testing and so forth or some children will finish the certification program at age 22, okay? Legally, in a perfect world, it is a 60-day referral process. So when that family leaves that voicemail with the school district to initiate the IEP or special ed services, the 60, it's a 60-day process, okay? Within 30 days, usually, that particular IEP team or assessment team, depending on the child's needs, was scheduled I, the assessment part of it, usually within 30 days, the assessment team, okay? After the assessments are done, the assessors have done the reports, right? Then the IEP meeting will be scheduled after that. In a perfect world, again, things may delay things, I understand that, but 60 days, the IEP must be completed, and by the 60th day, services must start. Federal mandated, all right? Who goes to the meetings? So when you guys sit in IEP meetings, I don't want to. I, I, I want to ask the question for those who have sat in IEP meetings, right? Parents control this. It's the children's. It's the child's party. They can invite whoever they want. Former therapist, nanny, somebody that works with the child can go to the IEP meeting, right? Family guest, special ed and irregular ed teacher must be present at the IEP. Uh, representative administrators from the school district. It's usually the vice principal or the principal or some form of administrative uh, personnel that will moderate the IEP. And of course, other professionals may be part of it, especially the ones who assess the child will be part of the meeting. Sometimes families bring their own private folks, which is fine. Again, 
parents must let the school district know how many people are coming so the school district is prepared, okay? But it is controlled by the child and the family. Some families do not bring their children because distractions, right? It's, it's a, this is about a three-hour meeting, two, three-hour meeting. So depending on your child and the attention span, maybe it's a good idea to get a sitter or something for that three hours so mom and dad can concentrate on the IEP, okay? I'm, I know I'm going a little bit fast here. Uh, again, the IEP, the elements, present levels of their current developmental levels, annual goals, benchmarks, special ed services that the child's going to get in the IEP, um, ex ex education or statement which the student will or not participate in the general ed classroom. Everyone, in an IEP, students can be in special ed classrooms, but some of them are pretty high functioning, can actually enter a typical classroom as well, like for math or English. So the whole concept, and I'm very passionate about this, it's full inclusion. Children belong to their schools, all classrooms. They have a right and opportunity to be taught in a regular classroom setting versus a special ed classroom, if they are able to, and especially with supports, all right? I'm a passion, I'm very passionate about inclusion. We have to start to include these folks. That's been an issue all these years is inclusion. I know outside of the school district, you can watch news, you can watch all this stuff. We're somewhat divided in this nation. We, we everyone in this room tonight, look at the multicultural diversity in this classroom. After whatever you learn today, I want you guys to remember, we belong, okay? We belong. I want you to remember that. I want you to carry that message to your students in the future, okay? We belong. Let them feel belong. If a child has a disability or autism in your classroom, teachers, it's your job. Make them belong, okay? That's my message to you, all right? Um, also, what's also presented, you know, they're going to project a date of the initiative of services, and obviously, we're going to do an annual meeting every year. Parents are allowed to call an IP meeting prior to the year. So if they feel the IEP is not working out, they can call for an IP meeting within the year. Okay. Um, again, these are purposes, stuff you can read. These are the qualifiers for special ed services. I have 10. Some school districts have 12. Some have 14. But these are pretty much the core. Some school districts break down these categories um, a little bit more in advance. Um, this is why I'm showing you this. Obviously, this is a little different from early start, okay? You only had three categories, but these are some of the categories to which children can become eligible for special ed services in your school district, all right? From autism to orthopedic. This is the most popular one still is learning disabilities. That's still number one, even way over autism. Learning like um, dyslexia, um, ADHD, Learning disabilities is the number one uh, eligibility uh, criteria uh, for children who receive special ed services through the school district, all right? Deaf and hard of hearing, multiple disabilities, because some of them may have a combination of things. Intellectual disability, formerly known as mental retardation, is a category. Uh, hearing impaired, uh, speech and language impairment only. Um, so depending on the child's eligibility criteria, that's going to define their IEP services, okay? And again, we're going to talk about services and closing, securing signatures. I'm not going to go into, you know, the, yes, the question is, do parents always agree to the IEP plan? The answer is no, okay? They have a right to an appeals process. I'm not going to go into that, but the parents control this. If the parents love the IEP plan for their child, yes, they're going to close it out and with the signatures and so forth. But there are some situations where the families are not content with the IEP plan they're not going to sign the IEP at that time, and they're going to move further along with the appeals process, okay? I'm going to stop here because I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions right about here. Here we go. Okay, again, the IEP process starts at age three. Now, if you work with a child on a personal professional level or know a child, right, that never received early start services, that's okay. Now, if you work with a preschool kid, right, four and five years old, and you're like, wow, there's something going on with this kid. Let the family know who to call the school district, okay? Call the school district. I only have LA Unified's number, and I know a lot of you, in fairness, don't work for LA Unified or live in LA. Um, I can give you the LA Unified number off the bat, but, okay, um, 
it starts with that phone call. Now, again, Dominic and Nancy, I know you have questions. I know Liberty has a question there too. Uh, again, this is a voluntary, per this is a voluntary type program. Okay. Every school district is different. The whole idea is for you guys, teachers, right? They have to succeed in your classroom. Okay. If the families are not following through the IEP process, believe me, the teacher and the principal and the parents are going to have to have a meeting about this because the teacher is solely responsible for all the children in the classroom, not just one. Okay. And the job for you teachers in current and present is for you to have that child succeed in the classroom. If the parents are not following through with the IEP process to get supports for them to be successful in the classroom, then you're going to have a private meeting with that parent and the principal and so forth to talk about that, your child, that particular child's progress. All right, Nancy, then I'm going to go to Dominic. Nancy. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, I know that it's, um, it's for us educators, but are the parents also able to make that referral themselves? Yeah. Nancy, good question. Nancy, all of you in this classroom, I know you guys are teachers. This is not for students. This is, if you can spread this out to the community and to the parents, that'd be awesome. Nancy, the parents are the experts. They're the ones that have to make the referral to the regional center and or the IEP process. It's parent driven. You can suggest or recommend it to the parent, but it is the parent that has to call the school district or the regional center for early start to initiate that process. Okay, thank you very much. And then, also, where okay. is that, where can parents or us as educators find that information? I'm gonna give you the website right now. Um, I, I, can't, I can't multitask. So after I talk a little bit, I'm gonna give you some websites so you guys can go into the regional center. And the, the school district is pretty much their home school. So if it's L Unified or Whittier School District, whatever school district you belong to, I don't know all their phone numbers, but you would simply call the special education department from each school district to uh, initiate that process. Dominic. Thank you. No, thanks, Nancy. Dominic. Uh, yes. Uh, I also, I wanted to get some advice on how, as educators, we were distinguished between just uh, actual intellectual delays and someone just falling behind. Yeah. Um, Dominic, in our field, Dominic, we can only recognize delays. We're, we're, I, I'm in the field for 25 years. I don't diagnose. I never do. But I recognize the need and the delay. If I see that, Dominic, I'm going to get my resources and give them all to the parents to call. Um, it is a child. This is why I teach child development, because the number one thing for child development students, and for all of you, you guys need to understand milestones, right? Dominic made a good point. You, you guys need to recognize delays, right? You guys are school age. Uh, my heart and soul is birth to three. I can observe children birth to three and I already know if they have delays or not, right? But you as educators, for you guys, if they're struggling in a classroom setting, that's your benchmark, Dominic, if they're struggling. Then you have to take notes and make some observations. And then you make that meeting with the family about the IEP process. Okay, thank you. Jasmine. Hello, I have a quick question. I'm so sorry if you already answered it. No. Um, I've been back and forth with both of my kids. No worries. Um, I do have a son who is autistic and I'm enrolling him into school, right? I wanted to see if he can get an aid because um, he is considered, I guess, like a danger to himself because he runs out to the street and right. runs out of doors. They told me that I can't... Um, I cannot request for one because there should be enough teachers in the classroom. Would should I try to fight that or is that Jasmine? Okay. If, if this is this is regarding your IEP, so this, this is an example of what it, had you, you you had your son's IEP, correct, Jasmine? Not yet. So we're in the process of that because okay. once they told me that, I was like, oh, I was like, I got Jasmine. And you're care. I'm going to give this. I used to be an advocate, but I want to give you that much advice. But here's my advice to you: at your IEP meeting, okay, mm -hmm. Jasmine. You're going to list your son's, your concerns about your son, need, why he needs a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. okay. So in your IEP meeting, this is your meeting, Jasmine. This is your son's meeting. Request the service. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you so much for that. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, let's go Nancy again. Or Brenda. Yes. Um, 
if if we, we as a teacher only have a slight suspicion of delay and parents feel that that they are um noticing can they still submit the request to LAUSD uh, even though the as a teacher we only have a minimum sus suspicions Brenda as I said before earlier if you even have a suspicion make the referral okay yeah because okay. you want to protect yourself because if if you make the referral let the let the assessors make that determination because let's say you don't make the referral and the child continues to struggle Brenda you're going to live with that for a while so make the referral make it safe let the family go through the assessment process again the assessment process is painless it's free let the assessors tell the parents that hey we do have concerns right and brendan made a good point right so then if a delay is recognized then the child can get appropriate services and brenda when that child gets services brenda your child's going to be successful in your classroom that's the whole goal yeah thank you lena go ahead man there's quite i'm going to try to get to all of you uh, yeah, hi. First of all, super informational. I really appreciate it. Thank but you, um, I want your opinion on how to deal with parents in denial. You can, there is no opinion. Uh, Lena, here's my experience working with parents. Uh, unless you have a child with special needs, you will never understand their emotions and feelings behind this. So don't. And the famous quote to all of you, never say to a parent, I understand. Because you don't. All right. So mental health, we just had a lecture on mental health last night. You, you as teachers cannot measure a, child, a parent's mental health and don't even go there in terms of, you can recognize they may need help, right? Through counseling and so forth. But yeah, you know, mental health is a great aspect to this in education field. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but if you have some families or parents that are going through these stuff in personal manners, refer them to the um, counseling department and so forth and help them with that. As teachers, you have boundaries here. And I know a lot of you are personally attached to your parents. I know you love them, you wanna help them, but you teachers have to draw the line, okay? You have boundaries, give them to the appropriate professional to handle all the other stuff you cannot control, okay? Only control things you can, okay? I hope that answered your question. Uh, Deborah, I think I saw Deborah or somebody. You did. That was one of my questions as well, because sometimes parents have some very extreme resistance when you tell them they have a child with a learning delay. You're right. And then they come back at your admin or they That's come right. back at you personally. Yep. How do you protect yourself in Deborah, those instances? Well, Deborah, first of all, I got a lot of those in the regional center for 25 years. I've been called many things. Um, and I didn't even do the assessment. <laughs> so listen, um, Deborah and everyone in this room, be proud of what you do. You are protected, okay? You're doing your job. Whoever assesses, whoever gives a diagnosis, that was my job in the regional center. You, your child is three years old. You qualify for the regional center. I'm gonna go over that in a little bit. Your child is diagnosed with intellectual disability. That just changed. It used to be called mental retarded. How do you like to give that speech to the parents? Right. So you are going to give it to them as a professional. Don't be go behind the bush here. You got to be honest with them. Well, maybe he's autistic. Maybe he's not. No, he's autistic. Let the parent have the emotions. They have to go through that. They may call you things that you probably don't want to hear. But at the end of the day, we do our jobs and we control what we can. We cannot control the emotions from the families. And most of the time in the regional center, some families are asking me, can you change it? Renee, all the school districts, right? Hey, can you guys change the diagnosis so other teachers can know that I got this and I got that? Deborah, stick with your guns, stick with the assessment, stick with the diagnosis. You are lying to the parents if you're changing. So don't. Trust your instincts, trust the professionals, you're right, Deborah. You're going to have a lot of emotions from parents, but that's not your job. You already did it. And the other side of the coin, Deborah, we may give the diagnosis to families and they never called the IEP process, right? Again, you cannot take that personally, Deborah. It's parent driven, it's volunteer. Okay. On the other side, professionals can get upset too, right? But we can't. Okay. We do our job, we move forward because promise you, Deborah, and to all of you, there's another child in line waiting for you. 
Okay. Deborah, I hope I answered your question. Uh, Jasmine, Dave, yes, thank you good? very much. Are we good? I'm going to talk about the regional center. I know I have like 10 minutes here. Okay, I'm going to go to the regional center and I promise you I'll be open to questions. This oh, is no, I, I, I had already asked my question, but I know that I don't know. It says Christian Steve, and she's been asking to ask you a question, but nobody. Oh, has go ahead, questions. Christine. Go. I want to ask you a question. It was more of a personal question. Go um, ahead. I wanted to know, um, kind of a two, two part question. First, what made you come into um, your field? Because okay. I mean, Good. it's a it's very difficult to to do what you do. And um, second, what would be something that you would say to a new teacher to make them come into your field? Listen, so back in college, 1987, I was a freshman at Long Beach State, right? So my original major was physical therapy, not happening, all right? So I walked, I always packed my little, I had a moped, a little scooter back then, and I always parked in the child development department because it was always free. Just to be honest, it was free parking. So every time after class I would go there, I always passed the preschool center. And hence, my love for children grew from there. And then I became, I declared my major in early childhood development. I would, to this day, I'm the only male to graduate at Long Beach State in child development. So I'm proud of that. But I need more males in this field, right? My mom, to this day, and people of my friends, still thinks I did it for the girls in college. Uh, maybe, but I'm not going to tell you that part. But... Child development's my love. So I focus on child development and special ed graduating. When I got my master's in 2000, going back to Long Beach, I got my job at Pierce College three months later. And so in the re working at the regional center, you got to have passion in this field. You got to have dedication. There are a lot of people, a lot of my friends personally cannot be in this field. You have to have your heart and your dedication and passion for children, number one, to even introduce, introduce yourself to work with children. You got to have that. And Walt, and I know you guys will get this beaten down to a pulp here. Multicultural, multi, multicultural diversity. Everyone in this room, teachers, I'm looking at this, uh, our, my presentation here. We, you guys must accept multicultural diversity, all the students that you teach. You may disagree with certain things of their culture, but you have to respect them, okay? Respect their culture my number one advice to you. Because if you don't, you don't belong in this field. I'm sorry, okay? We can have differences of opinions, but please respect your students' culture, okay? They come from different backgrounds. You have to, address, you have to transition to them, okay? As you and the, and the cultures from the different families and kids you work with have to transition to you as a teacher as well, okay? Okay, I'm going to go over the regional center. A lot of you don't know about the regional centers. The regional centers is only a state of California. It's only given in the state of California. Uh, this is not in your midterm. Frank D. Lannerman, there's a law called the Lannerman Act. This is the reason why the Lannerman Act exists today. And this is why the regional centers exist. Okay, I'm giving this lecture last because this has nothing to do with the school district. Okay, however, this is an important resource for teachers because, again, you guys may make a referral for that child to the regional center. And this is how or why you would make a referral to the regional center. So here we go. The Lanterman Act in 1968 was developed. Ronald Reagan was our governor. I'm old here, so some of you may not know who Ronald Reagan is, but Ronald Reagan was our governor in California. He was the sign, he was the one who signed the Lanterman Act here in the state of California. Okay. What is a Lanterman Act? 1969, it gave persons with developmental disabilities the right to get services and support they need to live like people like us. They're equal to us. Because in the 1900s and 1800s, these folks were in state hospitals, asylums being experimented on and abused. 1969, they took that away. The Lanterman Act protected these folks. Okay, to make a long story short, all right. The first regional center established was in Children's Hospital. It was called the Lanterman Regional Center, 1966. Just for, for good. Now we have 21 regional centers, okay? Each regional center encompasses a geographic area of California, okay? We're run by the state of Department of DDS, Department of Dental Services. You guys are Department of Education. We are State Department of Dental Services, okay? Obviously, each regional center has a board of directors. With 20. Today, I can tell you this. 
21 regional centers in California. We serve over 480,000 clients, consumers in California through the regional center system. 480,000 and growing, okay? Now, here's the ones I want you guys to know before I leave today. These are the people that qualify for the regional center. You remember an early start, we talked about established risk. This is what established risk is. These consumers are gonna receive regional center services for life. I'm gonna give you the website and all that so you guys can look into it, okay? It's DDS website. It's a very cool website to talk about the regional centers of what kind of services they provide, okay? So for a person or a child or adult to be a regional center consumer for life, they have to fall under these conditions, intellectual disability, mental retardation, same thing, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism. Autism is a growing lecture. We just had the lecture three weeks ago. One in 54 children are being diagnosed with autism now, okay? So that's going to be an alarming uh, child rate going into your school programs, okay? Autism is another lecture. I'm not going to go into that. And then we have a category called the fifth category, conditions closely related to intellectual disability. So we have a lot of children and adults who have significant medical conditions that are ID level, okay? They'll just be placed either ID or the fifth category. But these disabilities here that we described in the Lanham Act, they must originate prior 18 years of age. Unfortunately, if, a ch if someone comes to me at age 30 and didn't get recognized before age 18, they, they will not qualify for the regional center. Again, these diagnoses, of all the things you learn about the regional centers, I'm gonna give you the website here right, real quick. They must have these categories to become regional center uh, clients for the rest of their lives. And again, in early start, some of these children have these conditions. That's why the third category is called established risk. All right, real quick, real quick. Uh, DDS, we already talked, these are some of the services regional center provides to these, um, our clients, right? Early start behavior services, independent living skills for adults, case management, which is you, service coordinators, if you want a job. These are just some of the services. You guys are going to, we provide respite care. That's the company that I work for. So if you guys are interested in providing caregiving, let me know. Um, we do vocational training, lots of services, right? So again, I'm going to stop here because I just wanted you guys to understand. So as teachers, if you feel that the child has five, one of these four disabilities, okay? Then you can let the family know to make the referral to the regional center as well. Regional centers and school districts are one plus one equals two. We work together. We collaborate. We network. Okay. So again, some of the kids that you have in your classroom in special ed or regular ed may be a regional center client as well. Okay. Woo! There's so much to give you guys. I, oh, Lord. You, what are some questions? I'm trying to help you guys here. I know you guys are busy today. What are some questions? Hi. Who has uh, questions? Who has a question? Uh, Christina. Hi, how Christina, are you? sorry. I'm, I can't go chat. Okay, I'll go to the chat soon. Oh, that's okay. Um, my question is, you said once they've been diagnosed, they can be part of the regional center as uh, up to age 30? For... Oh, regional center, uh, it's for life. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And currently right now, do you guys have recreational uh, or, or uh, socializing activities? Uh, for school age children, I know we have social skills. So like uh, for children with autism, we have difficulty with socialization. Usually it's uh, an after school service. We provide okay. social skills. However, regional yeah. center, because it's a budget, we don't provide recreational stuff like horseback oh, okay. riding. But like socializing, like socializing or yeah, we do have some socializing events that we can okay. regional centers provide. Yeah. Socialization. Okay. Let me tell you guys, teachers, yes. this is a big state of California driven thing. There's two things in this field. Social emotional development is a big deal now in our field, right? So we're looking at children birth to three. Mental health is going to be a huge aspect to our field today. All right. We cannot forget about mental health. That's another lecture. We just had that last night. Um, so again, to all of you, use all your mental health resources you have in your school district, because I promise you, teachers, it's going to come up. And you said you were going to provide the website? Yeah, I just provided my, uh, uh oh, hold on. Everyone in the meeting. Okay. Thank good. you. That's my email. And here is the uh, www.dds.com ca.gov that that website is my that's my email address above 
And that's the website if you want to learn about the regional centers. Okay. Hey, Hiroko, go ahead. Yes, hi. Thank hi. you. Um, you said earlier that um, referral or um, the process is initiated by parents, but you also said that teachers could start the referral process. Can you clarify that? Yeah, the teachers can start the referral process. So you'll meet with the parent. I'm going to initiate the IEP process. The problem is some parents are hesitant because in order to start the IEP process, um, Haruko, the parents have to sign on to it. And sometimes parents are hesitant to sign on to it. So we do have those parents. Uh, the teacher, you did your job. And if the parents don't sign in, don't want to initiate the IEP process, then we have a little problem here because the teacher can do so much to further along that child success within their classroom. But if that teacher feels you cannot, then you have to have a meeting with the principal and talk to the parent. We have to give some options here because maybe that classroom is not appropriate for that child. Right? Okay, so the teacher um, talks to the parent, but they don't go to the regional centers or the school district. Right. The parents do that. But our responsibility have, as the teacher is to talk to the parents. Um, and Haruko, the teachers can talk to the parent. You can actually initiate the referral to your principal, but that's one thing. You did your job. Awesome. But the problem is there are some parents that don't want to sign on to it. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. You, you, and then, yeah, okay. Go Got it. Thank you. And then the other question was, if you wanted to be that service coordinator, what's the qualification they look for? Thank Man, you. Man, the regional centers welcome all types of, um, of um, experience hopefully you have some experience of working with a population like children or adults, even with the field of uh, special ed. Um, they favor that. You know, when I was interviewing, if you're in child development, you're an automatic. So under, in early start, it's very unique because you actually have to understand the milestones and all that. But I hired folks from social work, from art, art major, right, creativity. So it, it depends how you do in an interview, but your background experience helps, of course. You don't need masters to begin. No, for service Got coordinators, it. if you want to move up to management like me, you have to have a master's. Got it. Okay, thank you. Good question, Roko. Thank you. Who else? Becca, the answer to your questions, yes. Or Deborah, the answer to your question is yes. Whoever wrote that question? Can parents of child with special needs be teachers? Yes. But for those parents becoming special ed teachers, please do not take it personal. How's that? Who else has questions? I know you guys have to leave. Who else has questions? I'm trying to bounce around. Dominic, go ahead before we go. Yes, um, my nephew, he was born born with some borderline autism. Yeah. And he, start, he started off at the Ooh. regional center. Oh now he's entering preschool, so he's a part of the school district. Yeah. Like, is he still getting extra assistance, or how does yeah. that work? Well, you're going to get your IEP services to the school district, right, Dominic? And then you can also get regional center services. The regional center services are typically for that age group. It's like respite, like what we do. Yeah. Okay. So man, parents need a break. Well, call our company, we provide caregiving. And then the other services usually Dominique is ABA, Applied Behavioral Services, Behavior Intervention, right? Because those behavior services, you may get in the school district, but the behaviorists will work with the child in the home. So those are the common services that the regional center can provide along with that particular child's IEP services. Uh, I'm just asking, because my, yeah. my brother yeah. told me that once you get sent to the district, they kind of dropped him from regional services. That's not true. Then you ha then that person has a terrible service coordinator. They're not doing them that justice. That's wrong. All right, I'll, I'll have them try and find some extra. Yeah, help. just talk about the services. Talk to the service coordinator. You're that particular child service coordinator. They're the ones that have to initiate all this. Don't tell them I said this, but they got to do their job. All right, thank you. Good. Um, Ab Abigail. Um, hi, let me see. Did I unmute? Okay, I did. Hi. Um, I was wondering about um, kind of 2E and twice exceptional. How do I help support and understand like as I'm pursuing to become a teacher, but I'm also a mom of a 2E kid that's in TK, but he's doing, you know, he's considered twice exceptional. So I wanted to know how to support a gen ed teacher doing that. And if I become an educator, how do you kind of help support somebody that has those disabilities as well as those exceptionalisms um, 
in a classroom. Yeah, you know what's funny? If, if a student is gifted, they're classified as special ed for some reason. I have no idea what it's right. So that's weird. Um, Abigail, you know, I don't have school districts resources. Abigail, you have to go to your school district and get all those resources. Um, what I do, I read on things because there are a lot of things I don't know about the systems and so forth and disabilities and stuff. Um, you research, you call your school district, and you make sure that you get all the resources you can from them for your family and the parents and the students that you're dealing with, Abigail, as a future, hey, there he is, as a future educator. Um, yeah, you're, I hope you're not driving, uh, but, um, but yeah, Waiting Abigail, for pick up. <laughs> Abigail, this is more resource driven. I, I always encourage okay. you guys to um, get that information, especially your school district that you're going to work for. <laughs> they have all those resources for you. Okay. So just kind of stay engaged with those resources have, within I that do it community. All the, I, have to. I do it all the time. I've had some people say you need to find an advocate to get him into a non-public school. And I started researching that and I'm kind of. Well, you don't have to get an advocate, Abigail. I mean, some people out there like family focused resource centers, they can help you because they're free. Oh. Um, okay. The I didn't public, know about that. Even family though you're sources. Not a regional, even though you're not a regional center client, you can call the FFR family focused resource centers. They're the we heart, are at regional. They're the heart and soul of the regional centers. They can give you advocacy as well. And Abigail, you do have a right to enroll your child in a public school. Okay, you do have that right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can. Thank you. Anyone else? I know Renee. I'm running time here. Okay. Thank so, you very much for the workshop. Awesome. Hey, if you guys have, I, I put my email out there. I didn't get my number. I'm not going to do that. No way. Um, and uh, email me if you have personal questions. I know some of you um, have um, questions about personal cases and stuff. I'll be glad to give you some advice, maybe not the, you know, a direction, if you will. But email me. Um, I'm going to email it one more time to you, just in case for those who just walked in the door. Um, email me. I'll be glad to respond to you. And maybe we can chat. I, I can talk to you on a personal level on the phone and all that stuff. Um, but uh, I hope I'm spelling you right. So that's my email address. Oops, sorry. Well, hold on. I didn't do it right. Man. Hold on. I did it to one person. Before I leave, I will give you my email address again once more. See, Henry, I had to make, I have a horrible spell. There you go. That's my email address. Okay. Are we okay with questions? Are we good? We're good. That was a lot of information. Thank you very much. I appreciate sorry, no, your time. I tried my best to get everything in there. I'm sorry. There's a lot of information, but please use your PowerPoints. That's going to help you and email me if you have any questions on the PowerPoint. I wish you all the luck in the world. You're our future. Very happy to be part of your success. I wish you all the best and I'll see you down the road. Okay. Thank you so much. Guys, have fun this whole week. Have fun, everybody. Have fun. Take care of yourself. Got it. Take care. I'll stand for a little bit until you guys all leave me. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Have fun, everybody. Bye. Bye, Delfina. Bye. Thank you so much. I'll stay on until everyone leaves. So if you have any questions, I'll be on for a little bit. Abigail, you're okay? Dominic, you're good?
okay, guys, I'm going to leave. You guys take care, okay? <laughs>